This is Space Time, Series 26, Episode 149, for broadcast on the 13th of December, 2023. Coming up on Space Time, the Hubble Space Telescope placed into emergency safe mode. The new joint European and Japanese Earth Care mission slated for launch in May. And the joint AUKUS Military Alliance to build a deep space radar station in Western Australia. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA's Hubble Space Telescope has been placed in emergency safe mode following an issue with one of its gyroscopes. Mission managers say the orbiting observatory is in good health and its instruments are all stable. The telescope automatically entered safe mode when one of its three operating gyroscopes suddenly gave faulty readings. The gyros are used to measure the telescope's turn rates and are part of the system that determines which direction the telescope is pointing in. While in safe mode, science operations are suspended and the telescope waits for new instructions from the ground. Hubble first went into safe mode on November the 19th, although the operations team successfully recovered the spacecraft to resume observations the following day, the unstable gyroscope caused the observatory to again suspend operations on November the 21st. Then, following another successful recovery, Hubble again entered safe mode on November the 23rd, and it's been there ever since. Scientists are now running a series of tests to try and characterise what the issue is and work out if there's a solution. Now, if necessary, the spacecraft can be reconfigured to operate with only one gyro. The spacecraft had six new gyros installed during its fifth and final space shuttle servicing mission in 2009. Now, so far, three of those six gyros have remained operational, including the one that's currently experiencing fluctuations. Usually, Hubble uses three gyros to maximise efficiency, but could continue to make scientific observations even if only one gyro remained working. There have been a number of proposals suggested for another servicing mission to the orbiting outpost, and this latest issue adds some urgency to that idea. In fact, back in September last year, NASA and SpaceX decided to examine a plan to send a Crew Dragon spacecraft to reboost and possibly service Hubble in order to extend its life. The baseline concept involved the Crew Dragon spacecraft docking with Hubble, possibly using a capture mechanism installed during the last shuttle servicing mission in 2009, and then raising its orbit. Hubble's orbits gradually decay due to atmospheric drag, and it's now flying at around 535 kilometres above the Earth. Continued orbital decay creates a 50% probability that Hubble will re-enter Earth's atmosphere in 2037, bringing a fiery end to the mission. The SpaceX Dragon servicing mission would raise Hubble's orbit back up to around 600 kilometres. That's where it was first deployed by the Space Shuttle Discovery over three decades ago. And that would add an additional 15 to 20 years to its lifespan. This time last year, NASA issued a request for information from commercial space operators of various concepts for commercial missions to reboost Hubble. The agency received eight responses, including one from satellite servicing company Astroscale in partnership with space transport company Momentus. Their plan would use Astroscale's currently under development dock to attach to the Hubble and then Momentus's orbital transfer vehicle, a sort of space tug, would attach onto the dock and lift the telescope into a higher orbit. But while all that's quite feasible, and similar operations have already been carried out with privately run satellites, replacing Hubble's gyroscopes would require a very different sort of mission. This is Space Time. Still to come, a look at the new joint European-Japanese Earth Care mission and the AUKUS Defence Alliance to build a new network of deep space radar stations, including one base in Western Australia. All that and more still to come on Space Time. The joint European-Japanese Earth Cloud Aerosol Radiation Explorer mission, or EarthCare, has now been slated for launch in May next year on a mission to advance science's understanding of the interaction between clouds, aerosols and radiation in Earth's atmosphere. 
The 2,350 kilogram spacecraft is being jointly developed by JAXA, the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, and the European Space Agency, ESA. It'll be launched into space aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket from Space Complex 40 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Base in Florida. Clouds remain one of the biggest uncertainties in how the atmosphere drives the climatic system. A better understanding of the relationship between clouds, aerosols and radiation is a high priority in both climate research and weather prediction. For example, what happens to infrared radiation when emitted from the Earth's surface and trapped in clouds? And what role do aerosols play in reflecting solar radiation back into space? And then how do these processes affect climate and weather? The Earth Care mission will provide novel observations to answer some of these questions using four state-of-the-art scientific packages. There'll be an atmospheric LIDAR or light detection and ranging system designed to measure the vertical profile of aerosols and clouds in Earth's atmosphere by emitting light pulses and then analysing the reflected signal to precisely provide the distribution and properties of aerosols and clouds, including their altitude, their thickness and detailed optical properties and aerosol types. This information will be crucial for improving cloud models and understanding the role of aerosols and clouds in Earth's energy balance. Then there's a the cloud profiling radar. It'll allow scientists to observe the internal structure of clouds. Operating in the millimetre wavelength range, the cloud profiling radar penetrates through clouds and light precipitation, providing detailed insights into their vertical structure and velocity, particle size distribution and water content. The radar is essential for studying cloud processes such as their formation and dissipation, and it will contribute valuable data for improving weather climate models. Also aboard is a multispectral imager. It will provide a much wider field of view to give context to profile measurements. It will be able to capture high-resolution images in multiple spectral bands in both the visible and infrared part of the spectrum. This will allow scientists to differentiate between various types of clouds, aerosols and the Earth's surface. It will also provide a three-dimensional cloud and aerosol field using the atmospheric LIDAR and cloud profiling radar data, which is crucial for understanding the radiative impact of clouds and aerosols on the Earth's climatic system. And finally, there will be a broadband radiometer, which will measure the radiative fluxes at the top of Earth's atmosphere. As the satellite travels along in its orbit, the radiometer views the atmosphere from three directions, allowing it to accurately quantify the amount of reflected solar radiation and the outgoing thermal radiation emitted by the planet. This is known as Earth's energy balance. And comparing this to the radiation calculated from the combined observations of the other instruments will help scientists improve their current understanding of aerosol-cloud radiation interaction. This report from ESA TV. Clouds remain one of the biggest mysteries in how the atmosphere drives the climate system. A better understanding of the relationship between clouds, aerosols and radiation is a high priority in both climate research and weather prediction. For example, what happens to the trapped infrared radiation emitted from Earth's surface? What role do clouds and aerosols play in reflecting solar radiation back to space? The Earth Cloud, Aerosol and Radiation Explorer satellite will answer these critical scientific questions. Let's take a closer look at the instruments. The Multispectral Imager instrument will provide an overview in multiple wavelengths to set the scene. The Cloud Profiling Radar will detect vertical motion within clouds, providing details on their internal dynamics. The Atmospheric LiDAR will detect the top of clouds and it will provide profiles of the atmosphere with information on aerosols. The broadband radiometer will observe reflected sunlight and heat radiated from the Earth, measuring the reflected solar and outgoing infrared radiation. Making coincident measurements, EarthCare's unique set of four instruments will provide a comprehensive view of the interplay between clouds, aerosols and radiation. And in that report from ESA TV, we heard from EarthCare's Mission and Optical Payload Manager, Koska Wallace. This is Space Time. Still to come, the AUKUS Defence Alliance to construct a new global deep space radar network, including one base in Western Australia. And later in the science report, global emissions from fossil fuels are now expected to hit record highs this year, increasing by 1.1%. All that and more still to come on Space Time.
the Australian, British and United States Defence Coalition, AUKUS, have announced plans to build three new deep space radar installations in the United States, Britain and at Exmouth in Western Australia. The trilateral initiative, known as the Deep Space Advanced Radar Capability, or DARK, will be specially designed to provide a new space domain awareness capability tracking dangerous objects. The network is slated to be operational by 2026 and will provide 24-hour global and all-weather coverage, which has been difficult to obtain with existing technology. DARK promises several advantages over existing radar systems tracking objects in geostationary Earth orbit. It boasts higher sensitivity, better accuracy, increased capacity and more agile tracking capabilities. The facility will be partly funded by the United States Space Force and is currently being developed by Northrop Grumman. The announcement was made jointly by the Australian Defence Minister Richard Miles, the UK Secretary of State for Defence Grant Shapps and the United States Secretary of Defence Lloyd Austin. The tripartite agreement is the latest step in strengthening the alliance between Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States, which has already seen agreements for Canberra to buy at least three Virginia-class nuclear-powered submarines from the United States and for Australia and Britain to combine forces to build a new fleet of American technology-based nuclear submarines. This Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Global emissions from fossil fuels are projected to hit a record high this year, increasing by 1.1%. A report by Earth System Science Data has found that there is no sign of the rapid and deep decreases in total emissions which are needed to tackle climate change. While emissions are declining in some countries, the report shows that these simply aren't enough to reverse the overall growth in global fossil fuel emissions in countries such as China and India. A new study has found that biological women who drink energy drinks in the lead-up to becoming pregnant could be more likely to have high blood pressure during their pregnancy. The findings reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association are based on data from two different long-term health studies. Both studies included data on energy drink intake, and the researchers compared this to a range of adverse pregnancy outcomes, including miscarriage, gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, gestational high blood pressure, and preterm birth. The researchers said that of all the outcomes they looked at, only high blood pressure was associated with energy drink consumption, and the association was only found among participants from one of the studies used. The authors say this means their findings should be interpreted with caution, especially because energy drink consumption is relatively low among participants. However, more research should be done of the potential risks of energy drinks. A report in the British Medical Journal claims that young people who use social media on a daily basis are more likely to engage in risky behaviours such as drug use, unprotected sex and fighting. The research is part of an international systematic review of meta-analyses into risky behaviour. The study's authors analysed the results of 126 previous studies on teens and social media, finding that overall frequent or daily social media use was associated with higher odds of drinking alcohol, using drugs and tobacco, sexting, inconsistent condom use and antisocial behaviours such as bullying, fighting and aggression. The researchers say exposure to content showing similar risky behaviours was most strongly associated with the behaviour. They say that while most studies relied on self-reported data on social media use and risky behaviour, which could have influenced the results, their study showed more research should be done into which aspects of social media could cause the most harm. It's been a big week for AI, with Google launching its new AI model and AMD launching their new artificial intelligence chips at its Advancing AI conference in San Jose, California. With details from the conference, we're joined by technology editor Alex saharov Royt from TechAdvice.life. AMD have secured their place in history alongside NVIDIA as a company that can make the chips that power these generative AI systems, the ones that are giving all the answers to chat GPT from OpenAI, from Hugging Face, from a range of different large language models. And AMD, of course, this AI is the most transformational technology in 50 years. And the biggest driver, of course, has been generative AI. So they now have this AMD 
Instinct MI300X chip. Now, this chip is almost twice as powerful as the one from NVIDIA, the one that they're selling for between 25000 and 40000 US dollars a pop. And you need several of these. You know, some systems have hundreds of these to power the generative AI systems that have taken over the world in the past year. They also have the new 8040 series of Windows chips. So this is the chip that runs Windows, Windows 11, and can run Linux and other programs. And they launched one earlier this year called the 7040, and it had the first AI neural engine inside of an x86 chip for PCs. And now they're launching the second generation of this AI-powered line, the 8040, with an even more powerful AI chip. And they've done this. They're launching the second generation AI chips for PCs before Intel has launched its first generation. So very positive news from AMD, who continue their market leadership. This week, there's also the news of the AI Alliance. What's that about? Well, IBM, Meta, AMD, and a total of 50 companies have launched their new AI Alliance. This is an international community of learning technology developers, researchers, and adopters collaborating together to advance, they say, open, safe, and responsible AI. But interestingly, OpenAI, the company behind the world-famous chat GPT that everyone else is trying to copy, they're not on the list. And of course, they're saying all the right things. There's all these things I want to do. You can read the full uh, press release that I've reprinted from the Alliance on Tech Advice life. But there's a lot of regulation that's coming down the pipeline from different governments. Uh, Europe, uh, the US, the UK, they're investigating AI. They're going to be regulating it. And some of these companies well, are trying to get ahead of the Skynet, curve. Aren't they? Well, they are. They are. And of course, they've made a big solid dance about responsible AI. But all these companies want to be part of setting the agenda, not following someone else's agenda. And when you've got ChatGPT and OpenAI on one side, getting all the money and the fame and the kudos, even though there's quite a number of other companies who are just as powerful, they're banding together with this alliance. And uh, look, they're only got to in the last week. We'll yet to see what the true results are, but yet more AI news. And Google's launched its new Gemini model as well. Yeah, they're calling it their most capable AI model yet. And they say that it's built from the ground up to be multimodal. So this Gemini can generalize and seamlessly understand, operate across, and combine different types of information, including text, images, audio, video, and code, all at the same time. So you can give it very sophisticated prompts, and it can do this multimodal reasoning and advanced coding and it's got three different sets so it's got ultra pro and nano so it can run on a data center right down to your pixel phone and it can do the sort of chat gpt responses right on your phone without having to go into the cloud but it's got this flexibility the system can scale from data centers right down to your mobile phone so this is something that google is doing to compete with chat gpt4 and the upcoming chat gpt5 and the power the engine you have running your ai systems determines how quick and smart and good it is and how often it doesn't hallucinate it doesn't give you the wrong information and uh, Google has just launched their challenge to the rest of the industry. And what else is on the website this week? Three dictionaries have got AI words that have entered their words of the year list. So for Oxford, the word of the year or one of the words of the year was prompt which is the question or the statement that you give to a GPT to create what it is you want. And the more detail you give, the better the result. For Cambridge, the word is hallucinate, where your GPT system is confidently spouting misinformation as though it's absolutely real, but it's absolutely wrong. And then Merriam-Webster actually has a sort of a, a redefinition of the word authentic. Authentic is their word of the year. And this, you know, with the rise of artificial intelligence, uh, you've got these deep fake videos. You've got the actors who are worried about competing with AI versions of themselves. You've got uh, AI writing scripts. You've got AI doing all these things and there's going to be a move back to people who are able to handcraft something made by humans, not made by AI. And so uh, they're highlighting the word authentic because it's got a different flavor now that we have all this AI fake artificially generated stuff. So that's their word of the year. Uh, there's also hackers who are predicting the biggest cybersecurity worries in 2024. Uh, LG's brand relaunch, Microsoft launching its new incredible Seeing AI app, and plenty more. Please come and visit techadvice.life. That's Alex Sahara of Royd from techadvice.life. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. 
and you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more Space Time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 